Today we're going to be looking at the various angry space wolf coffins. Hello and welcome back to Allspets Tactics, the strategy focused 40k channel where we're all about getting the most out of our miniatures on the tabletop. Today we're back for another Space Wolf video, and as per the poll that I ran on the channel's Patreon page the other day, it seemed that people really wanted to see an analysis of the Space Wolf Dreadnoughts. So in this video we're going to go through the Venerable Dreadnought, Wolf and Dreadnought, Murderfang and Bjorn. We'll take a look at their data sheets, any obvious combos or synergies on the battlefield, and how I would personally run these Dreadnoughts in a game of 40k. In the background, the Wolf and Dreadnought is created when a previously entombed battle brother succumbs to Canis Helix and exhibits the Curse of the Wolfen. Falling from grace as the tactical battle brothers of old, the Wolf and Dreadnoughts howl, twitch, and spasm in rage, and in battle are good only for being set loose on the foe in a flurry of murderous rage. They are typically outfitted with close combat gear as a result, such as Fenrisian axes, wolf claws, or blizzard shields. Murderfang is one such renowned space wolf, Wolf and Dreadnought. Found on the hell world of Omnicide as a feral dreadnought, carving its way through a force of Chaos Space Marines, and was captured by the Space Wolves and put into stasis to be brought back to the Fang for study. Murder Fang is entirely devolved from the warrior that he once was, with little to no control over its actions, and now remains entombed in a Hellfrost prison, apart from the scant times where it is deployed to the battlefield as an ultimate example of a berserker to destroy the enemy forces. Bjorn the Fell Handed, on the other hand, is an ancient and revered Space Wolves Dreadnought, famed to be the oldest warrior in the Imperium, and has stood watch over his battle brothers since the days of the Great Crusade. Bjorn has fought alongside Primarchs on multiple occasions, and commanded the defence of Fenris against Magnus the Red. Over the centuries, his status sleep has become longer and longer, awakening only intermittently, and when the chapter has its direst need. So let's see what these mighty warriors can do for us on the table, then. I think we'll start with the standard Space Wolves Venerable Dreadnought, as always a credit to Warhopedia for these excellent datasheets. So the standard Venerable Dreadnought is an elite's choice for Codex Space Wolves, and has the same stat line and advantages of the standard Venerable Dreadnought from Codex Space Marines. It has a 2 plus weapon skill and ballistic skill, and it has the unyielding ancient special rule where you roll a d6 each time it loses a wound, and on a 6 it's not lost. It can be a pretty decent fire support platform, armed with a twin last cannon and a missile launcher, and it'll cost you 140 points for doing so, but the Space Wolves version does have some interesting war gear options. Firstly, instead of the Dreadnought combat weapon, you can equip it with a Great Wolf Claw. This costs the same amount of points, so it's pretty much a trade-off on the stats. Great Wolf Claw is only strength 10 rather than strength 12, and it's AP minus 2 rather than AP minus 3. They're both flat 3 damage, but the Great Wolf Claw has the advantage of re-rolling failed wound rolls for the weapon. In general, this is going to mean that the Great Wolf Claw is a little bit better against light infantry than the standard Dreadnought Close Combat Weapon, and in general it will outperform the Dreadnought Close Combat Weapon in any circumstances that the AP-3 doesn't make a difference. Against most targets it maths out to be remarkably similar, basically the Dreadnought Close Combat Weapons tend to pull ahead a bit when you're fighting a 2 plus save opponent, but the Great Wolf Claw will tend to win slightly against most other things. For the most part I think that the Great Wolf Claw is very slightly better, so it doesn't really make all that much difference. If you do have a Space Wolves battle leader for reroll ones to wound, then the Dreadnought Close Combat Weapon probably is the better choice, so I could quite happily take either of these. Next, the Venerable Dreadnought has the option of a Hellfrost Cannon instead of its ranged weapon, and the Hellfrost Cannon is pretty interesting. It's very similar to a Morty Melter with a 24 inch range, heavy 1, strength 8, AP-4 and damage D6, but it only costs 17 points, so it's a fair bit cheaper. In addition, it has a different firing mode, which it can fire at heavy D3, strength 6, AP-2, but only damage 1. This one's pretty decent at clearing out medium infantry though, and it's good to have the flexibility. In addition, these have the Hellfrost special rule, which means if you suffer any of some saved wounds from the weapon but aren't slain, then you roll a dice and on a 6 the target suffers a mortal wound. This rule is honestly pretty weak. I think it might have been more meaningful if you'd actually triggered that on a 4 plus rather than just on a 6 and only when the target suffered wounds but not died. It's not nothing, but it really isn't much. I honestly think that it's probably better than the multi melter because it costs less and has the alternate firing mode, and I think I would pass up the melter rule for that. If you want a slightly cheaper Space Wolves Dreadnought, then this one's certainly not a bad option in my opinion. Though I must say, I am a big fan of twin las cannons on venerable dreadnoughts. Finally, you can swap out all of its war gear for a Finrisian Great Axe and a Blizzard Shield. This particular combo will cost you 125 points for the entire Dreadnought. The Blizzard Shield gives you a 4 plus invul save, which is a really meaningful durability increase, 
and will force your opponent to make a fair bit more effort trying to down the thing. The Great Axe is an interesting weapon. It is more expensive than the Great Wolf Claw or Dreadnought Close Combat weapon, at 30 points rather than 20. It has two attack modes, Cleave, which is Strength 10, AP-3, and Damage D6, but you subtract one from the hit roll, and Scythe mode, which is Strength User, so Strength 6, AP-3, and Damage 1, and you make two hit rolls for each attack made by the weapon. With Shock Assault, that'll be potentially 10 attacks, which actually does make the Venerable Dreadnought pretty decent at chewing through hordes. I think it's certainly an interesting option. The Dreadnought will be significantly tougher, but not deal any range damage whatsoever, and having the anti-horde mode on the Fenrisian Great Axe is certainly a positive, though the cleave mode for chewing through tanks and things seems to be just a little bit weaker than the standard Dreadnought close combat weapon, due to having the minus one to hit penalty. Still, if you're looking for a dedicated melee machine, then it certainly does that quite well. I guess one of my main issues with the Venerable Dreadnought is that it doesn't really move very fast, so you might have to slog through several turns of enemy firepower before you actually make it to the foe. Let's move on to look at the Wolf and Dreadnought now. The Wolf and Dreadnought seems to be more of a variant on your standard Dreadnought rather than the Venerable version. It can also only be equipped with those special Space Wolves combat weapon variants, so it really needs to compete against the Venerable Dreadnought for that. Its stat line is a fair bit different, it's got a move of 8, Weapon skill 3+, Ballistic skill 5+, Strength 6, Toughness 7, 8 wounds, 4 attacks, Leadership 7, and a 3-plus save. So 2 inches more movement, worse weapon skill, and much worse ballistic skill, but it can't get that many meaningful ranged weapons anyway. At base, it's armed with a Great Axe and a Great Wolf Claw and a Storm Bolter, though honestly, seeing as you can't attack with both of these, you should pretty much always swap one out for a Blizzard Shield, which it can. Interestingly enough, it can either have the Axe and Blizzard Shield, or the Claw and Blizzard Shield. The Claw and Blizzard Shield option is actually really quite cheap. It's only 100 points for the Great Wolf Claw, Blizzard Shield on that body. I think that the Axe is just a little bit weaker on the Wolf and Dreadnought, just because in its cleave mode, the anti-tank type one, it has minus one to hit, meaning the Dreadnought's only going to be hitting on force, which isn't entirely very reliable. Still though, that anti-horde mode with two attacks per attack is pretty darn decent. For me, it really depends on whether you want to pay 10 points extra to have access to a large number of attacks if you happen to be fighting infantry. It can also trade out its Storm Bolter with a Heavy Flamer, which certainly gets around its Ballistic Skill penalty, but it is 14 points rather than 2, and frankly, if you've managed to get within 8 inches of the opponent, then you're probably going to be messing them up in close combat anyway, so I'm not really sure if you need the Heavy Flamer, which might sometimes kill enough troops that might make your charge longer. In general, for me, I'd probably still keep it cheap with the Storm Bolter. In addition to boosted move, it also has the Murder Lust special rule, and this is the same one that Murder Fang, the character variant, gets as well. Wolf and Dreadnoughts get to re-roll failed charge rolls, and if they do make a successful charge roll, then you add 2 to the number of attacks he gets this turn. This is pretty decent combined with Shock Assault, it means that the Wolf and Dreadnought will be getting a whopping 7 attacks on the charge. If you were armed with a Great Wolf Claw, that would be an average of 8 or 9 wounds on your standard Toughness 7 vehicle. If you are armed with an Axe, then it would be an average of 6 or 7, but if you were fighting a horde such as Orc Boys for example, with getting a massive 14 attacks with Scythe mode, you'd kill about 6 of them, so it really can do some solid amphibian infantry work. I do like the way that this one's significantly cheaper than the Venerable Dreadnought with the same armament. Being able to get this for 100 to 110 points for me makes it better than the Venerable Dreadnought if you do want a Space Wolves Combat Dreadnought, plus having 8 inch move and murder lust for reroll charges means that it's a lot more likely to actually make it to close combat, or at least threaten your opponent more that they have to deal with it earlier than they might want to. Losing the 2 plus weapon skill and ballistic skill, and the unyielding ancient rule, isn't great obviously, but I think that the advantages for close combat patterns outweigh the disadvantages, and I'd use the wolf and dreadnoughts for close combat abilities, and keep the venerable dreadnoughts for more ranged platforms. If we move on to murder fang now, this guy is 125 points, and he's got a very similar profile to the Wolf and Dreadnought, but more killy and doesn't get a Blizzard Shield. Murder Fang is a unique Elite's choice. He gets Weapon Skill 2+, and Ballistic Skill 3+, so better than the Wolf and Dreadnought in that way, and he also gets 5 attacks. He retains the movement of 8, and that Murder Lust special rule for reroll charges and 2 additional attacks on the charge. He's armed with the Murder Claws, a Storm Bolter, and a Heavy Flamer. The Murder Claws are Strength times 2 so Strength 12, AP-3, and Flat Damage 3, and you can re-roll failed wound rolls for the weapon. This combined with 2 plus weapon skill, 5 attacks and murder lust, means that he's by far the fightiest dreadnought that we have access to, but he does bear the downside of also being one of the most fragile, not being able to get that 4 plus invul save, or even having a feel no pain type save. 
This is somewhat counterbalanced by him having the character keyword though, so it could be advancing up behind some wolf and dreadnoughts maybe, so your opponent has to shoot them first anyway. Character dreadnoughts are certainly very annoying to remove, as first you have to actually be closest to them, and then you still have to hit them with some very heavy firepower. In terms of just how much damage those murder claws do, again if we target this unlucky toughness 7 vehicle, you will do an average of around about 15 wounds to it. This is around double the ability of most of the other dreadnoughts on the list so far, so his sheer destructive power in close combat really can't be underestimated. Because he's a character, you could also soup him up with the Touch of the Wild stratagem, the one that gives him an extra hit on every roll of a 4+. With that going, it wouldn't be beyond the realm of possibility that he might be able to fell an Imperial Knight in a single turn. Having a Stormbolt and Heavy Flamer as well is just a bit of icing on the cake. So Murderfang is very destructive, he doesn't cost all that many points, has character protection, but is comparatively quite easy to kill if and when he gets exposed, as he probably will be when he's trying to charge down the enemy. Finally, we come to Bjorn the Fellhanded, who's very much the Premier Space Wolf's Dreadnought choice. He combines a lot of the best abilities of the other Dreadnoughts, including having a movement of 8, weapon skill and ballistic skill of 2+, plus. he has 5 attacks, and he even has toughness 8 to boot. He's armed with True Claw, a strength 12 Dreadnought close combat weapon, that has AP-4, damage D6, and he can reroll failed wounds for the weapon. Against this toughness 7 vehicle that we keep on beating the snot out of, he can actually do even more damage than Murderfang would, getting an average of 18 wounds through, due to hitting on 2s with his reroll, rerolling wounds, and also being AP-4. He's not quite as strong as Murderfang against light infantry, but he can pretty much wreck any heavy hitter that doesn't have an invul save in a round of combat. In his other arm, he can either be equipped with a Hellfrost Cannon, Heavy Plasma Cannon, or Twin Lad Cannon. Frankly, none of these are particularly bad choices, although the Heavy Plasma Cannon might well cause you some mortal wounds if you are moving and firing with it, which you likely will be. I could honestly go with any of these, though. They're all pretty reasonable damage output for the points that you pay. I will be very tempted by the Twin Lad Cannons, just because having Lad Cannons that your opponent can't shoot is quite a big psychological disadvantage, and can cause real problems for their armor wanting to escape being Lad Cannoned to death. If you do equip him with a twin last cannon, he is a little bit expensive though. He'll be 204 points, including the heavy flamer. If you filled him with the cheaper Hellfrost cannon, he's only 181 points. I mentioned his rerolls briefly. He has Last of the Company of Ross as a special rule, which basically gives him Captain Aura rerolls, with rerolling ones for friendly space walls within 6 inches of him. He has a Feel No Pain type rule called Legendary Tenacity, which means that he has a 5 plus Feel No Pain against Lost Wounds which means despite his lack of invul save, it's going to make him pretty decently hard to remove, with that combined with toughness 8. Finally, he also has Ancient Tactician, which means that if your arm is Battleforged, which it usually is, then you get an additional command point if it includes Bjorn. That's certainly one extra slight motivation to take him, as command points mean more fun and decent abilities that you can deploy with the Space Wolves. Character Protection is another decent benefit, meaning that, meaning that he won't be able to be shot as he moves up, and if you do choose to make him your warlord, his ability is Saga of Majesty, so he'd have a 9 inch aura of reroll ones, which is actually quite decent when it's already on a very big dreadnought base. You could be giving a huge amount of your Space Wolves army reroll ones with this one character if you gave him your warlord trait. Overall, Bjorn does significantly more than the other dreadnoughts, being tougher, fightier, and shootier, but he is also proportionally more expensive to boot. So, how can we get more out of the Wolf Noughts in game then? Firstly, their Hunters Unleashed rule will help keep them accurate with those Frost Axes and things. This one's particularly good with the Space Wolf's Wolf and Dreadnought, meaning it will still be hitting on 2s with its Wolf Claw, and hitting on 3s with the Frost Axe, even when you're using the minus 1 to hit profile. I probably should have accounted for that in the previous math, to be fair, apologies for that. Even for the ones like Bjorn that already hit on 2s, this could be quite useful in it, avoiding any negative to hit modifiers in combat. Savage Fury will also only help the combat variants, getting extra hits on 6s is great, so they'll get extra fighty when you do get to the close combat doctrine. In terms of character support, I could easily see someone like Bjorn being central to your battle line and having good synergy with the nearby characters. Iron Priests will certainly help out Dreadnoughts, maybe riding alongside, healing them for a few wounds each turn as they make their way towards the enemy. Iron Priests are a pretty solid choice in their Space Wolves army with Dreadnoughts, as they're also decent combat threats in their own right. Wolf Lords and Battle Leaders could also be helpful for rerolls, though of course Wolf Claws won't need the rerolls of one to wound. For Bjorn or the Venerable Dreadnoughts, having either Wolfen or Ragnar nearby could give them some reroll charges as well, and try and spearhead them into combat, and once there, there really are quite a lot of options in the Space Wolf Codex for buffing them in combat, not least things like Wolf Priests with Litanies. 
Sadly, Space Wolves don't have access to the Storm Raven for slingshotting Dreadnoughts into battle, but an interesting choice could be the Lucius Pattern Dreadnought Drop Pot, which for 80 points could throw a Dreadnought into the midfield. Could be a reasonable one to include with Murder Fang, for example. 80 points really does make it a premium option, though, particularly as you're not 100% guaranteed to make that charge once you've deep struck in. In terms of stratagems, the Wolves have access to a decent amount, not least Duty Eternal. To make one of your Dreadnoughts very tough each turn, best used when your opponent has committed a decent amount of firepower into one Dreadnought. Wisdom of the Ancients is always solid on Dreadnoughts, as making them into a Wolf Lord for a turn could certainly be handy as it buffs the damage output of themselves and also other units nearby. Armour of Contempt could be particularly good on one of those Blizzard Shield Dreadnoughts tanking things at the front, as Mortal Wounds are one of the more efficient ways to remove a high involve save, high toughness vehicle, and if and when Murder Fang or Bjorn get brought down in close combat, 2 CP for only in death does duty end could be a way to get their phenomenal damage output all over again. Finally, we already mentioned Touch of the Wild, the one that allows them to get extra hits on a 4+, plus, just puts Bjorn or Murderfang through the roof in terms of the amount of damage they can do, and one command point when they fight is really one of the best returns of investment in terms of damage output that you can get in the Space Wolves Codex. So how would I use these mighty dreadnoughts in game then? For this one I think we'll focus on the combat variants and beyond. Naturally the venerable dreadnoughts with ranged weapons are going to be wanting to sit back, and as I said before, I'd rather take the wolf and dreadnoughts if I wanted to make use of the space wolf's actual close combat gear such as blizzard shields and wolf claws and things. So firstly if I wanted to use wolf and dreadnoughts, I'd be equipping them with blizzard shields and either the claw or the axe, and then likely starting them at the absolute tip of the deployment zone as close to the enemy as I possibly can and using their 8 inch movements to get towards the enemy, strongly thinking about advancing if I couldn't make any sort of charges this turn. As they're solely close combat critters that aren't enormously fast, they really do run the risk of being ignored, so you need to just throw them up the table as fast as you possibly can. You could consider even buffing their movement with the Master of the Vanguard Warlord trait, from the Vanguard Warlord traits for Phobos characters, getting an extra plus 1 to move, advance and charge is exactly what these guys need. I'd be very tempted to buy a little support for them, particularly Iron Priests, which could repair them as they walk along, as well as being a very fighty character when they do finally make it to combat. These guys honestly are going to be a little bit limited as to what they can engage. They're just going to have to make the charge with the closest thing that they possibly can in the enemy army, and hope that their shields and close combat weapons give them enough might to make it count. I'm more of a fan of keeping these fairly cheap, things like the 100 point Wolfen variant, where it's not the end of the world if they don't make it to close combat, because there really are quite a number of ways of countering them, either by just deploying far back, move blocking with expendable troops, or even using things like Thunderfire Cannon Tremor Shells to slow them down so they take a long time to make combat. They're definitely a unit that can scare enemy forces into backing off a bit, but if you're playing against a clever opponent, they won't be making combat reliably a lot of the time unfortunately. I think they would help out with numerous other threats, pushing on the enemy turn 2 to really divide their fire priorities and perhaps provide enough of a distraction for them to get through and not get shot down before they make it into close. In terms of Bjorn or Murderfang, Bjorn's really the sort of character dreadnought that wants to be at the heart of an advancing space wolf battle line. Not on the front line, but somewhere just behind that, hopefully screened by durable units, so it actually has some decent synergy with a squadron of these guys moving up with blizzard shields. As I said, my preferred choice would likely be the last cannon, allowing him to contribute very meaningfully to the game as he moves up, while also buffing the army with the reroll once. He's a massive countercharge threat if the opponent goes anywhere near you, and when he does get to the front line, certainly later on, he is really not trivial to take down with toughness 8 and the 5 plus feel no pain, particularly if you also stack that with duty eternal. Murderfang is pretty much as lethal as Bjorn in close combat against most targets, but is a bit more limited in that that's all that he does. He really does need to be advancing up the board just behind the front line of screening units, and needs to be trying to make the earliest charge possible in a very similar manner to the Wolf and Dreadnoughts. If you can find any clever ways of keeping him well screened from the enemy, then that's certainly a positive. Things like maybe incursors or infiltrators hiding out of line of sight in midfield ruins, or maybe using some incredibly durable space marine units like impulses with shield domes or these Hell's Frost shield dreadnoughts to stay just in front of him, meaning that he won't be able to be shot before he does make it to his prey. Overall, I think that the Space Wolf Dreadnoughts are some of the better dedicated close combat dreadnoughts in the game, although I will admit that dedicated close combat dreadnoughts aren't generally considered quite as strong as some of the ranged variants. Having said that, I do think they could be a reasonable addition to a Space Wolf list, particularly the durable screening dreadnoughts, as Space Wolves really do like their screening units to keep their characters alive as they make it towards close combat. I think Bjorn's also incredibly strong as well, 
If you're looking for an HQ, then he is a really solid contender with the other options out there. Murderfang is just a little bit niche. He is a really strong counter-charge threat, but admittedly Space Wolves do have quite a lot of those if they want them. So he faces some fairly stiff competition from all of the fighty characters or combat units that the Wolves can deploy anyway. So let me know your thoughts and opinions on the Space Wolf Dreadnoughts, if you've had any success with them lately, and if you've found any other tricks to delivering them into close combat a bit easier. It generally is the problem when it comes to Space Wolves, and the Dreadnoughts being reasonably slow don't tend to help us out an entire ton with this. If you've enjoyed the video, feel free to subscribe to All Specs Tactics, there'll be plenty more content for the Space Wolves coming out over the next few weeks. And if you've been enjoying these videos, feel free to support me on Patreon. The videos do take quite a long time to make, and the channel's Patreon is how I can spend quite a bit of time on making them. So if you have been enjoying, any support is of course greatly appreciated. In any case, thank you very much for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.